we are on. Well, I will start with uh, a brief introduction, okay? Go for it. I'm uh, boys and girls and I'm very excited to have uh, the drum god himself at our channel. This is Mike Tirana and this is a miracle that uh, today is his birthday. Mike, oh, yeah. <laughs> best wishes. Thank you so much. How do you feel about it? I feel good. Uh, I'm 61 years old, but I, I don't know, I feel like I'm 25. 20. Nothing's really changed. <clears throat> Maybe I got some white hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. But <clears throat> still playing drums. Still crazy. <laughs> Have you played still drums today? Uh, I will play drums later today. Yeah, I'll play. Uh, yesterday I did a recording session for a orchestral metal band from Peru. Wow. And uh, I'm also recording a series of videos. I don't know if you see this on my social media, but yeah, on Instagram you make it every day. Yeah, Almost. I'm changing, kind of changing things up a little bit. The pandemic has forced all of us, not just musicians, to do different things with our lives. And uh, I'm enjoying doing these covers and entertaining people. And also I have a project called I Won't Stop the Music, which I started with some friends of mine here who helped me out. Um, and it's to, to keep musicians inspired, artists, musicians and people in general just not to give up keep going this will change we have to keep creating art I think we need to keep me personally I like to entertain people I think a lot of people now are having trouble but we have quarantines here in Europe heavy quarantines people are a bit sad you know so I try to do something to break it up give somebody a smile or some energy well you have answered uh, half of my questions already <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry well, uh, Mike, what what's the situation in Italy now? I I heard that it's not a good, it's the worst well, country in this pandemic situation. Yeah, it's strange. I mean, no, I don't really think anyone is dying. I think basically what the government is trying to do is starve out the virus. So we've had a quarantine that's almost, uh, it's not a heavy quarantine, but uh, there's a curfew at 10 o'clock at night. Of course, you have to wear a mask everywhere, um, and there's now there's different zones, red zones and yellow zones. Yeah. So it's starting to get better. I think maybe in the next month, <clears throat> when the warmer weather comes, I think. You know, but the positive <clears throat> side of the positive the positive side of this situation, I think, uh, due to this lockdown, we have the possibility to talk to a lot of drummers all over the world because they're locked at their homes. Okay. <laughs> home. yeah, 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 I haven't been on tour in 10 months. So the last tour I did was Latin America in, in March. I came home and then craziness. Yeah. Lockdown, very strange. The last but, week uh, we had a great conversation with Nick Barker himself. I'm sorry, I don't yeah. know. What is he playing for? Nick Barker. Yeah. Uh, drummer of oh, Cradle of Filth, uh, Dimo Borger. Dimo Borger and a lot of other bands. Well, let's go back to the past and uh, yeah. let's recall some memories about your beginning. Uh, I know right. that our uh, channel is a channel that is for drummers. A lot of drum, thousands of drummers on our channel. And there are a lot of geeky, nerd, drummy questions uh, uh, that I will ask you a little bit later, but uh, for the first, I want to ask you about uh, your beginning and about changes uh, in yeah. your feelings in the beginning and now. What, what have you felt in your beginning when you were a young drummer? How have you begun and what do you feel now? Uh, have it changed? Okay, um, <clears throat> I started when I was eight years old. <clears throat> My uncle gave me a drum set and uh, we put it up, we set it up in the garage, I sat down and I just started to play a beat. And from there I played, it was a, a white Marine Pearl Slingerland Radio King drum set. I still wish I had that. I didn't understand the value of the drum set. What but year now, of, I think, What year of production? Oh, it probably was from the 50s. Wow. Because it was my cousin's drum set and my Uncle Phil was my father's brother. He was like one of my favorite uncles. 
Where is it now? <clears throat> Where is it now? These I drum don't know. set. I, you know, when I was a kid, I traded it in for like a kind of a cheap Bryce. Japanese drum set that I thought looked cool but didn't sound so cool. I was eight years old. I didn't really understand what was happening, you know. Uh -huh. When you're a kid, if it looks good, then it is good. <clears throat> so it was new, you know. But uh, I started off on that and playing the Beatles records, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival, a lot of pop music. I used to set up my drums in front of the stereo. I had a big speaker. I used to put the speaker right there and just play along. And You know, I never thought about being a professional drummer at that age. I just was having fun, you know, and trying to learn how to play. And then when I was about 16, I started getting serious about it. And then some family members were like, are you really serious about trying to make a living as a drummer? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Well, just like, you can't do that. You can't make your hobby your job. And I was like, I think I can. I think I don't want to do this regular life. I wasn't really, I did okay in school, but I really didn't plan on being like a businessman or a engineer or a doctor. However, and of course, getting into other drummers like, uh, got heavily into John Bonham, Cozy Powell, Tommy Aldridge, Terry Bozio, Bill Bluford, um, Ian Pace, just a lot of guys that I grew up on, a lot of the rock music, and uh, no, I can I can honestly tell you, nothing has really changed. I loved the drums so much then, and I love them the same now. Do you play every it's day? I play every day for about six hours. Wow, every day. With, yeah, whether I get paid or not, it has nothing to do with money. I mean, that's what I tell guys. It's like, oh, you want to be a drummer and you want to be a rich rock star? Well, you're in the wrong business because uh, it's a passion you how know? do you keep Don't yourself you... motivated how do you keep uh, why you know, why do you play drums why 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 do i wake up and play drums yeah yeah why i just i just love it for me it's like uh exercise meditation fun yeah it has to be fun you know somebody once said uh, if it's not fun then you're not doing it right you know, if you're in the practice room and you're like, I have to practice and I have to read these notes and I can't wait to watch Netflix, oh, stop. I, I play because I love it. It's a form of self-expression. Uh, the drums is a very physical instrument, so it keeps me in shape. I'm not, uh, I drink a little bit of alcohol. I never smoke cigarettes. Uh, I'm training five days a week. I'm doing calisthenics <clears throat> in the park because all the gyms are closed. Mm -hmm. But I've always trained in the gym. I've always played sports. I was an ice hockey player. Yeah. As a what big age? fan of the Russians. Russian ice hockey team. They were fantastic. Who's Very your technical. favorite player? Who's, Sorry? Who's your favorite player? Oh, God. <clears throat> now, you know, this was in the 70s. Uh, the Buffalo Sabres had played the uh, Russian Army team. Wow. And it was a very, very cool game. But I grew up in the 70s, so all the all the guys that I liked didn't wear helmets. Uh, Gilbert Perrault. Wow. Uh, I liked Bobby Clark from the Philadelphia Flyers. Bobby Orr from the Boston Bruins. Great wow. defenseman. Uh, Sanders. Forgot his first name. Derek Sanders. Wow. Derek Sanderson. That's it. <laughs> You know Derek Sanderson? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, what about Derek. Russian players? Percussion players? R Russian, Russian. Russian players. You know, I don't, I can't remember offhand of the Russian players. I know there's a lot in the NHL right now. Ovechkin? But, um, sorry? Uh, Ovechkin. Who is he playing for right now? Um, New York. New York, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I'm kind of out of the new ice hockey. I should get back into it, you know, now that I've got some time off, but... Uh, like I said, I was watching the, 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 all the ice hockey stuff in the late 70s, early 80s when I was playing. Uh, did it so, influence your drumming skills? Playing ice hockey? Yeah. For sure. Why? <clears throat> I mean, ice hockey is an aggressive game. Uh, it requires a lot of endurance. <clears throat> I've been ice skating since I was like five years old, so I always like to ice skate. Uh, a lot of my buddies, when they were in high school, you know, a lot of guys were going and drinking on the weekends. I used to go ice skating 
Nerd alert, I was an ice skater. I used to go just skate around the rink. It was a lot of fun. They play rock music. I just practiced my ice skating. And <clears throat> I think that kept me in shape. It also got me into weightlifting mm -hmm. because we used to train. I even played ice hockey uh, up until my uh, early 20s. So uh, I think that game helped with my discipline and my physical fitness because and you have to be fit to play ice hockey. It's a, it's, a, it's an aggressive game for sure. What can you advise to build uh, stamina for a drummer? Well, uh, I do a lot of cycling now. Um, it's for and, the feet, uh, yeah? I, for, the, for the feet, for the first. Uh, uh, I used to jump rope. Jumping rope is a very, very heavy exercise. You can jump rope for 20 minutes and that's the equivalent of running about six miles. You get it done fast, but it's very, very good cardio. And it's, a, it's of equivalent of uh, 200 BPM double bass. You know what? I can't play at 200 BPM. <laughs> it's not so fast, Mike. My max, my max is 180. 180. Wow. I think yeah. that you can make it better. You can make it faster. Yeah. A way faster. I, I, I think if I practiced it, but I, I'll be honest with you, all due respect to all the, the metal guys out there, all the blast beat guys out there, they're, they're fantastic. I, I take my hat off to these guys, but I really don't like it. I don't like the, I don't like all that snare drum. It's too much snare drum. And it's, um, of course, a lot of these guys are using triggers. Yeah. I think when you get over, when you get to 190, 200, 220, I have seen some guys play without triggers. It's pretty impressive. But for me, it's like, I don't I don't really want to spend my time doing that I prefer more like uh, space between the notes I think it's more not more important but it's more pleasurable for me I think you have to play what you love you know I'm not gonna jump in there and say you know what I'm 61 but I can still blast with you young guys <laughs> it's not it's I don't even know if anyone would take that seriously you know you're more so. into groove yeah yeah, I'm in the group. I mean, also, you have to like the music around that drumming style. You have to like the music. So it, it's not really my cup of tea. However, I have a lot of my friends, drummer friends, play this kind of music, and uh, they love it, and they, they go for it, you know, and you have to be in good shape to play that stuff. A lot of practice to maintain your, your double bass speed. What's on your list now in uh, related in music? What do you listen to right now? <laughs> That's kind of funny. Wow. Uh, I, I play so much music that when I'm done playing the drums, I don't listen to anything. I, uh, I like to read and I'm living near the, the ocean. I like what do you do read? Anything. What do you read? What books do you read? Uh, I'm leading, reading a lot of autobiographical, uh, sorry, autobiographical uh, material. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right now at the moment I'm reading a book called uh, Anger is Energy by John Lydon, the singer of the Sex Pistols. Wow. Johnny Rotten. Very good book. Very interesting. He's a very clever man. Um, he's into I politics. Feel, where, uh, he's into politics. Yeah. He's into a little bit of politics, but I mean, it's not he's his stuff. He talks more about the inner workings of the Sex Pistols, which I find very fascinating. Wow, <laughs> that's great. You have to remember, all these guys in the Sex Pistols, the ones that are alive, they're millionaires. They only made one record. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very lucky guys. I think Actually, that it's due to Richard Branson. Yeah, Richard Branson signed the band, Virgin Records. Yeah. He's Another there. interesting guy. I've read some of his books as well. He's quite intelligent. Screw uh, it. Yeah. Let's do it. Screw it. His book. Let's do it. Yeah, screw let's it. Let's do it. Screw it. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. Got, he's got a bunch of books out. He's got several, several fantastic books. What Very about uh, fiction? Uh, I novels. Used to read a lot of Edgar Allan Poe, Stephen King. I love Poe. I mean, I, I studied literature in, in college, so I got into all that stuff. Uh, uh, all this night, nightmare stuff, yeah? Yeah, it's very interesting. Very good stuff. Um, I just read a very interesting book called uh, Me Incorporated by Gene Simmons, the bass player of KISS. It's a very good book for young people. I wish I could have read this book when I was 21 because it's a book about, not just about music, it's a book about being an entrepreneur, getting started in life and being your own boss. A lot of good information in there. I respect Gene Simmons. I think he's uh, quite a clever businessman, obviously. He's taken Kiss to great heights. So and there's something to be learned. And it's his buddy as well. 
and his body as well, Paul Simon. Paul. Paul is a Paul good Simon. entrepreneur as well. Yeah, I love Kiss. I grew up on Kiss, and I have to say that that's another reason why I got back into music. I was a big Kiss fan. I was a member of the Kiss Army in 1976. Long ago. I, yeah, I saw Kiss open up for Black Sabbath in 1974. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. I'm 61. I've seen a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been to their live concerts? Oh, yeah, for sure. I saw Kiss many times in concert. Uh, I saw the uh, Destroyer tour. Kiss Alive One, that first live record, I saw that tour. Probably one of the best concerts I've ever seen was in 1977. I saw Van Halen. Wow. I saw their first tour, and I have to tell you, we were, I was sitting there with my friends, and we were like, who is this guy? Who? Where did this band come from? We were completely blown away. I don't see that anymore. I don't see that anymore at live shows, but that was really uh, some rock and roll history. What was so impressive about it, uh, the playing of Eddie, or, or the whole band? What was so exciting? The whole, the whole band. The whole band was amazing. I mean, Alex Van Halen was cool. He did a drum solo with fire. Yeah. He had a cool double bass drum set. As a matter of fact, the, the, the lineup for the show was Van Halen, Ronnie Montrose, and Journey, with uh, Steve Perry at vocals. So. The first drummer was Alex Van Halen. Second drummer was Steve Smith, this, yeah, yeah. who later ended up in Journey. And the third drummer from Journey was Ainsley Dunsbar. Every drummer did a drum solo. For That's me, great. For me, it was a festival of, of drumming and great music. But Van Halen was like a punch in the face. Really, it was just, the, the next day we all went out and bought the record. All my friends, <laughs> we all bought that record. I had the eight track. You kids don't know what an eight track is. It's like a really thick cassette tape. <laughs> you've got the I mean, common. You've got the common thing with Steve Smith. He plays every day as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I love Steve Smith. I think Steve Smith is a fantastic musician. Not only technically speaking, but he's very musical. He's got a lot of knowledge. He's a he's a great person. He's a great teacher. I actually did a drum clinic with Steve Smith. I opened up for him. Well, we Back have we have an episode with Steve Smith on our channel. We did an interview with him. Take a uh -huh. look later. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, please send it to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I love Steve. I love Steve. He's uh, of course, he's a drum ambassador. He's, yeah, yeah. He's the man. If you got a question, you ask Steve Smith. Have you seen him play recently on this Zildjian, um, Zildjian sessions? Did uh, you see his performance? The last year. Yeah. Last year was a Zildjian, the Zildjian performance. You have to watch it. It's amazing. It's very, it, it, very Is beautiful. it Zildjian Live? Yeah, Zildjian Live. Uh, Smith, check it out. It's amazing. <laughs> I think it's not on air still. No, I think it's on. You can find it on uh, YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Okay, I will. If I find it, I'll send you. I'll search it and send you the link. But it's it's an amazing performance. Okay, okay. Let's go back. Let's go back again. Okay, where do you want to go? Uh, to where? How did you play then? How did you play then and how do you play now? What's the difference? Oh God. Well, I was horrible when I started. I mean, I, I was He was afraid? I didn't... He was afraid? Uh, Are you, were you afraid of uh, playing dr no. live? No, I was never afraid. Never afraid. I, I think <clears throat> maybe the first time I remember I played in front of people at my school, I was a little bit nervous. But then when I started to play, it went away. And from then on, I kind of got like... I got bit by the bug, <laughs> and it was like it's a drug. You know, that's I don't understand a lot of musicians that that get so wasted. I understand doing drugs to open up the mind for creativity, but I don't understand being so drugged out that you can't enjoy the live experience. For me, playing live is a drug, and once you get a taste of that, and you you hear some, you know, many people go to work every day. They come home, nobody claps. Yeah, okay? yeah. When I when I finish my job, people, hey, very good, very good. Oh, I want more. <laughs> Not for the ego. It's just I don't know. It's it's fun. It's fun to play and see people smiling. So when I started, I was not very good, and I had many people tell me that I was no good. <laughs> people told me you suck. You're horrible. Get a job. Don't quit your day job. You're a dreamer. <clears throat> and I read a lot of books on positive thinking, which helped me over that, because a lot of people will talk and 
they're afraid to try something new, so they put that fear into you, and that's not cool. So I say to anyone out there who has a dream, whether you want to be a drummer or an artist or a businessman, do it. Don't listen to anybody else. Just do what you feel. Benjamin Franklin once said, find something you love to do, and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah. So when I wake up in the morning, it's like, what are you going to do today? I'm going to play drums. <laughs> oh, what a hard day. I know people that go outside and they're, they're working on the street in this cold, in the sun. Yeah. I also used to do that when I was a young man. I was a garbage man for, for two years in New York. I was hanging on the back of a garbage truck. That's why you became so strong. <laughs> Part of it, maybe, because that job, you're picking up garbage all day. But <clears throat> I remember hanging on the truck and thinking, I want to be a drummer. <laughs> I remember dreaming. I just, I was out of my body. I wasn't even there. I was not at work. Yeah. You know, I was just doing the work to buy the drum equipment. I bought lots of drum equipment. <laughs> <laughs> you well, never have enough drums. Well, I, I've got a very simple question. Right. How to become uh, a great drummer? Uh, very simple. I'll, I'll tell you what, being a great drummer, I don't think it's so much about being technical. There's a lot of guys that can do a perfect buzz roll and they're staring at the snare drum. If you put this guy in an arena or a big theater, you want the people, not everyone plays drums. Not everyone can appreciate the subtleties of your perfect buzz roll. So I think what's important is to have a personality, to to be uh, to have an image, to be able to entertain people. You have to remember, we as drummers, we're sitting down. We're, the keyboard player and the drummer are sitting down. We're in the back. Sometimes they don't even turn on the lights. So how do you reach people? How do you get noticed? You know, sometimes some, some, sometimes is the reason why people choose drums because they sit in the back because they're afraid of the audience. That's true. A lot of drummers want to be in the back. Um, yeah, yeah. I've even, I know some, some Scandinavian drummers, they're really shy. They're great drummers, but they don't want to do drum clinics because they don't want to be alone. They want to be behind the band. Uh, who, cool. who, you know, who, for instance? Everybody's different. Who, Not for me. instance? I like to be in the front. Who, for instance, from Scandinavians? Oh, I don't want to mention anybody, but um, <laughs> it's just uh, a couple of guys. All I've these uh, black them. metal guys? Sorry? All these black metal guys? Not necessarily black metal guys, but guys that are playing kind of uh, some some blast guys and some guys that are playing like, you know, this uh, heavy prog odd time stuff. They just told me, you know, I, I like to play my drums, but I'm not really comfortable being alone. Maybe that's, that's the so reason. Hard. Maybe that's the reason why they play so fast, because they in their own um, uh -huh. sphere. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. They're not entertainers, they, they're into no. themselves. Yeah, I think, they're, I think they're playing for themselves, they're playing for the music. Of course, when you're playing so fast, there's not a lot of time to do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The symbol, they have their cymbals low and they're just concentrating and they're serving the music. So uh, I understand that completely. Maybe it's but, different styles, yeah? Yeah, but I think a lot of young people would like to see a drum clinic from these guys because they want to know the secrets right? very exciting astonishing yeah yeah sure all the young guys want to blast they think that's uh that's really uh, everybody wants to play fast everybody not not i don't know why not anybody but, thinks about music no 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 only fast only speed but let me ask you a question how what is the fastest a guy right now is playing what's the fastest uh, metronome setting for double bass blasting uh what is feet you mean feet? Yeah, feet. I think that the guy uh, from Divine Heresy. Mm -hmm. Do you remember his name? Uh, yeah, I don't remember his name, but he played with uh, Dina Casares from Fear yeah, Factory. Yeah, he's from America. I forgot his name. Uh, Tim Young. Tim Young, yeah, Tim Young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Young, I think yeah, that he's he's the he's the fastest one. How fast is it though? Oh, five hundred thousand. <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't know the digits. Okay. 220, 230. <clears throat> no, 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 300 and more they play. 300? Yeah, yeah. Super okay. fast. But they play heel toe uh, and the swivel techniques. They don't play heel up. But well, what kind of music can you put around? Fear Factory, Divine Heresy, and all those bands. They use okay. uh, Nile, okay. uh, 
George Coley is from Nile. Yeah, it's 300 and more. It's bl mind blowing, mind blowing. Wow. I think that's See, the I... is the separate genre of music. It's not it's not yeah. the music itself. Yeah, it's, it's just, very extreme. It's a sport, sport. Yeah, it's a sport. But for me, the music has to have a nice feeling, happy, a good groove. Yeah, but, but I, I'm sorry, they they all say that they play music, not exercises. They say, we love music, we play music, this is music, this is the genre of music, and we play music. They all say about grooves, and that's well, very astonishing. George, George, George Colias made a fusion record. I mean, they, these guys can play, they're into other yeah. kinds of music, but this kind of music is so extreme that I... Really, I can't listen to it. It makes me nervous, okay? It makes me very nervous. Call me an old man or whatever you want, but I would never put that on in my house. And the message in some of this music is negative. And I think you don't have to go very far outside of your house to find some negative bullshit. So why would I listen to this stuff in my house? Silence is the best music. Silence. No? Silence is the best music. Well, when I'm done making music, I like silence, you know? I used to listen to a lot of music when I was a young man, uh, all kinds of stuff, Genesis and Rush and UK. I was a big Rush fan. Neil Peart, yeah. Love Neil Peart. It's a shame that he's gone. He was a, a brilliant man and a, a, another drum ambassador for all drummers in the world. There were two dr god, drum gods, him and you, and you're not, you're the only one now. <laughs> no, I don't think I... Because he's passed away. Gods. Yeah, he's passed huh? away. He's passed away and you, you've you stayed the only one. Definitely. Well, Mike, uh, what are your plans now? What do you do in your everyday life? On a daily basis, what do you do now? Locked down okay. in your house? Yeah, well, I wake up... I know up, that I you're, you're a very energetic man. And I know that you can't stay on the sofa thinking about the uh, universe and so on you just do do active active well I do relax but I mean here I live by the beach and sometimes I walk maybe 20 what, kilometers. what city what city are you in now at the moment I'm living in Sardinia it's an island Sardinia wow that's great yeah, yeah. and uh, it's very uh, quiet here and uh, the beach is very beautiful the water is very clean so I clear my mind and I walk uh, I think uh, I come back. I'm a vegetarian, so I eat some good food. I train. I do my calisthenics. I go and play drums. You don't uh, lift weights? Not at the moment. Uh, I, I enjoy lifting weights, but uh, now what is I your found that I'm... what is your maximum lifting? Oh God, I don't know. I think I at one point I was a uh, bench press. You mean? Yeah, yeah, bench, bench. press. Yeah. I think maybe not so much 130 kilos. well uh, that's great yeah I mean I, you know what lifting I, I hurt my shoulder and I hurt my back you can get hurt in the gym so I'm me really too careful me too with my joints yeah you have to be careful with the free weights a lot of people don't realize that. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna be careful because the form is very important yeah uh, I think it's related to drumming as well yeah, most of the things that I do <clears throat> for my recreation are helping my drumming. Yeah. Drumming is my love, it's my main <clears throat> my main passion. And you play day. six hours a day? Yeah. And what part, what in particular do you play during these six hours? Oh, a lot of different things. Uh, believe it or not, I'm, I'm playing a lot of jazz. And I am uh, I'm uh, have some contact with Don Lombardi from the Drum Channel. Yeah, I know. I, I sent him a video that I did as a tribute for Neil Peart. I played the 2112 Overture. And uh, Don was nice enough. He said, Mike, here's a, a, a membership to the Drum Channel. And you can watch all the interviews we did with Neil Peart, which is really cool. And then I discovered some drum lessons from Greg Bissonette. Mm -hmm. uh, basic jazz. And I went through the whole Greg Bissonette jazz course, and I'm playing jazz. I'm not a good jazz drummer, but Greg is a great teacher. Of course, he's a fantastic, world-renowned drummer. He's a, he's a great guy. I he's with uh, Ringo now, yeah? Yeah, he plays with Ringo Starr. Pretty cool, because he's a big Beatles fan. 
But I mean, Greg can play any kind of music. He can read. He's uh, he graduated from uh, Texas University, a music school. But his jazz course is amazing, <clears throat> and it really helped me. Playing jazz has made me a better, more musical drummer. It's a different technique. Uh, it's very good for your coordination, independence. <clears throat> of course, I play some double bass exercises. I'm working on a book right now uh, for double bass. But your it's not your own book? Your own book? Yeah, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be a virtual book. It won't be on paper, but uh, it's just the knowledge that I built up for myself. I like to play double bass, kind of broken up in grooves. I don't like to go do -do 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 all the time. Okay. For me, it's I actually think it kind of destroys the music. It has to be done in the right spot. If you watch Simon Phillips, he plays double bass. Yeah. But when he when he starts to, it's very musical. It's used in the right spot. It's got dynamic. Dynamic. It's a, a feeling. It's a. It's not so rigid. You know, I did a lot of records in Germany with a lot of these power metal bands, and they quantized my drumming, and that made me crazy. You don't like would it. Would you quant? Would you quantize John Bonham? <laughs> would you? Me not. <laughs> no. Well, these guys are quantizing the modern drummers, and you know what that does? It erases the personality. It, it erases your signature. It could be a drum machine. What's yeah, the point? yeah, yeah, yeah. Program it. So you are against all these Pro Tools and stuff like that? Well, I'm not against Pro Tools. I think it's a great technology. If it's you can use it any way you want, but you know, would you take a Picasso painting, feed it into the computer, and straighten it all out? No. Yeah. So. If someone is playing the, 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 a little bit of shit, you're not going to hear that when everybody else... If everyone in the band plays on the drum track, it's going to go. Put a click track up to a Led Zeppelin record. It's, it's moving. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, moving, yeah. but it, they're all moving together. Yeah, yeah. That's called groove. John Paul Jones and John Bonham, that's, that's one hell of a rhythm section, man. You uh, yeah. learn a lot from those guys. <laughs> Recalling uh, Black Dog, for instance. It's moving all on, the way. You put on any Led Zeppelin record, okay? It's a drum lesson. It's a music lesson for everyone. That band was amazing. It's yeah. a blues-based rock band. No one played like John Bonham then, and no one plays like him now. You mean you can? No you mean you can use the knife to kill people or cut the bread? Yeah. It's the same tool, but That's you can right. use it differently. That's right. It's and then you wouldn't take a hammer to fix your iPhone. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you have to have different tools in your in your toolbox to play different kinds of music to approach things. So this but pro tool is not the answer. <laughs> so this pro tool stuff is not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, when I was a young guy, I had producers tell me again and and if you can't play it I'll get someone else to play it. In other words, if you're not good enough to be in the studio, then get out and come back when you're good enough. That's why, I mean, when you hear Jeff Beccaro, Steve Gadd, yeah. or look at all the drummers. I mean, I'm into swing music. Uh, Irv Kotler, who played with Frank Sinatra. Sonny Payne, played in the Quincy Jones Orchestra. You see Sonny Payne, he does all kinds of tricks with the sticks, but this guy's got a groove. Buddy Rich, these guys played live. On tape, one take, one take. One take. No punching, no quantizing, yeah, no yeah. samples. Okay, and it's good. Mitch Mitchell, Ginger Baker. How do you think? How has it influenced the music? All this Pro Tools stuff and uh, just taking single strokes and making a whole song from these strokes. Yeah. Well, I'll say one thing. It 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 has affected the music, how music is made, and how it sounds. And I think what's happened, not with all of the, not with all of the drummers, but there's a lot of drummers that are in famous bands that really can't play in the studio. And they can barely play live. That's why you hear a record, it's happened to me, I won't say the name of the band. I was into this really heavy band and I was listening to the drums and I was like, wow, this guy must be a monster. On tape, he sounded like a monster on the CD. I went to see him live nothing wow about you like, you mean you mean Lars <laughs> no hey a lot of people talk bad about Lars Ulrich but I can tell you one thing that guy started 
a complete genre of music. <laughs> this, and, uh, this is a joke. Yeah, it's I fun. know, I know. But really, uh, you know, a lot of people say bad things about Lars, but before you talk bad about Lars, you should try to take your band from level zero to the best, most popular metal rock band in the world. I, I always answer you try to play his songs, try to record it and show to the people. And not yeah. a lot of people can do it. No, it's not easy what he It's played. not easy it's what he played. He's, he's really good. And the thing is, a lot of people are like, oh, he, he, he's sloppy. Whatever. No, that's his style. It's cool. Maybe he he's a little bit worse than he, he was before. Yeah. But he's, okay. the, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's a great drummer. Look at it this way. Look at it this way. How many shows has that band done? Wow. I saw Metallica's first tour in a bar, Kill Em All. I didn't even know who they were. I was like, what is, what kind of music is this? A thrash music. What okay. city have you been then? Sorry? In what city have you been then? Uh, I was living in Buffalo, New York. And the concert was there, yeah? Yeah, they played a club where I used to play called The Salty Dog. And then it turned into the Sky Room. It was upstairs. And it, was, it wasn't even full. There was really no people there. It was maybe a couple hundred <laughs> people there. It was a huge room. Held a couple thousand people. No and, iPhones, uh, all this shit no stuff. IPhones. And the other thing is, I saw Metallica open up for Ozzy Osbourne on the uh, Master of Puppets, yeah, tour. Yeah, what's what? What album is this? Master of Puppets. Yeah, Master of Puppets. Well, that album went platinum with no radio play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Th they were. They rocked, man. I mean, they gave Ozzy a run for his money. Ozzy was great. Randy Castillo was playing drums. I loved it. But Metallica was good. They were really good. And that's really was not my kind of music. Also, I've seen Dave Lombardo play live with Slayer. Uh, this guy's not messing around. That's old school. <laughs> He's hitting that stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's laying it down. That's real. There were no triggers. There was no Pro Tools when these guys started. And he self-taught still going yeah he's, great he's, guy. Self, he's a great drummer he's self-taught Lars self-taught yeah. a lot of great drummers are self-taught me too and, and uh, I think that uh, education is not a necessary thing no I, I can help you I, I think being educated being able to read music being able to write out your parts understand other other people's instruments I think it's important but to develop your own style I think there's no better way than to to find solutions to your own problems yeah it's helpful yeah I mean really you know when you have a piano there's middle C you cannot change the piano with drums you can put anything wherever you want you're free and that's what's cool about it so I think you know break the rules create your own style be an individual play with passion play good what specific things are you currently working on in technique uh, double bass some double bass exercises uh, like I said the jazz stuff have you seen and, uh, uh, Thomas Lang uh, school video school of Thomas Lang yes three CDs uh, it's so lengthy have you seen have that? you seen this have you seen his uh, video school of Thomas Lang a lot no, of what? a lot of uh, Thomas Lang yeah, okay, I know Thomas. Of yeah, 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 yeah. His feet exercises, a lot of feet exercises. Have you tried oh, them? Yeah. No, uh, well, actually, I've got two of his videos, and I've, and I've uh, gone through some of those exercises, and I've talked with Thomas about some of this stuff. He uh, does Thomas, He does circus st style yeah, Thomas stuff. Is, yeah. uh, Th Thomas is almost not human sometimes. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, 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 yeah. He's a drummer's drummer. Uh, he's a great guy, also has a lot of information. Uh, my my exercises, I would say, are, are more primitive. I, I'm basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give people stuff that they need to know. There's a lot of guys doing stuff that you'll well, do this. I do this, and I do this. Yeah, but why? Will you ever use that in a recording session? No. Mm -hmm. I'm recording a lot of records in my house, and let me tell you something. That's when you learn how to play drums, because. I have to punch myself in. I start. I'm, I'm using the Logic program. I've got the microphones there. I'm, I'm kind of an engineer. I'm the producer. I'm the drummer. And you learn. Okay, there's a part. I don't understand this part. Okay, what is it? You listen to it. You play some fills. Mm, 
No, that sounds bad. That's too much. You'll always start to find out that you start to design your drum fills in a tasteful manner. And it's not always... <laughs> you, have to, you have to kind of subtract things and make it fit into the track. You have to support the music. And I think a lot of guys are not making records. I see a lot of these YouTube star drummers. Um, they haven't made a record. They haven't done a tour. They're just playing in their room and they're famous. Yeah, yeah. Really, what have you done? Have you ever have you ever been on a stage? Have you ever been? Uh, uh, have you ever had someone throw beer on you because your band sucks? You know, <laughs> I've played in bars all over the world, man. That's great. And what about the audience uh, in the in different parts of the world, which is more into uh, super excited about the shows, more into having fun? I would say uh, probably that the craziest, most energetic audiences are the Latin Americans. Everybody says that. Everybody. Yeah, the Brazilian, the Mexican, uh, Argentina, all, all the Latin countries, uh, Chile. Venezuela, Latin, El Salvador. Sorry. Yeah, Ecuador. Beautiful country, by the way. I recently played there uh, with uh, Avalanche. Fantastic. Great people. Beautiful place. Good place to retire, I think, if you want to relax and uh, they have good food and it's warm weather. Um, uh, secondly, I'm not saying this because you're Russian, but the Russian audience is amazing. And I've toured all over Russia for many years. The people are uh, the people are cool. They get into the music and they like to have fun. I remember when I was on tour with Tarya, my drums were in the front on the side of the stage. Yeah, yeah. And we were we were playing a club and there was a lot of young kids in front of me and I was giving them sticks and water and they were they had a lot of fun you know they really appreciate it so i like the russian audience very much god bless them you are very related to russia you have a vk page not yeah. a lot of drum not a lot of foreign drummers have the page maybe you're the you're the only one maybe oh yeah why well i well i got into that when i was on tour over there i mean i have some friends of mine from the the band aria yeah um and uh you know I, i talk with my russian friends over there that are in the business and they they're on vk and i said oh maybe i should go on vk and and uh check it out but you know for me as an american i grew up in new york during the cold war yeah. and I, and i thought i remember watching some documentary it was actually a talk show called the mike douglas show it came from philadelphia on the in the afternoon and i used to watch it with my mom and i remember they had one week of a special where they went to russia mike douglas went to russia and they filmed inside the stores and i was like i was watching it like <laughs> wow behind the iron curtain horrors you know? huh horrors horrors no, from russia it, it wasn't horror but it, i mean it really looked um it looked different that's for sure and i thought well i'll probably never go there and then i remember i arrived in russia the, my first tour i was in russia with rage yeah and i remember being in moscow and i remember standing in the red square and i was like wow man i'm here and you know what it looks a lot smaller when you're there when you watch the stuff on tv <laughs> and you're a kid in america you see the kremlin's like wow this is really heavy duty stuff you know but it, it was interesting and then some of my friends took me to space city outside of moscow and i i got a book signed by some of the cosmonauts because i was into the space program nerd alert but uh uh i got to see the uh centrifuge that they used and uh talked to some of the cosmonauts it was cool wow really cool Korolev. cool stuff in russia Korolev town yeah it was in Korolev. Korolev. Korolev town yeah? yes yes i think it's about like an hour and a half outside of moscow yeah, yeah, yeah. my my friend took me there we spent the whole day there i put on the russian spacesuit the scarfonda <laughs> i have pictures of it but i was the guy was much smaller than me so i couldn't get the whole thing on but that was pretty cool he was in the muir space station all the all those suits are not big yeah yeah they were smaller I, maybe they picked smaller guys because it's a small capsule you probably can't be a very big guy up there But uh, it was interesting to speak with them, and I have this book. Also, I remember 
my on my first tour in Russia, a lot of Russian fans gave me stuff. They gave me books in Russian. Uh, they gave me the Shaslik swords. Yeah. yeah, I have all kinds of stuff. Russian uh, army hat, a lot of cool stuff. A lot of this, a lot of this stuff is not Russian. Do you know about it? No. <laughs> Shaslik is not Russian it? thing. What is it? Where's that from? It's a Caucasus. It's Georgia. Uh, Georgia. Georgia. Yeah, yeah. It's from Georgia. Okay. Maybe that's where I got it because I remember being in Georgia and we ate some really good food and there was a lady there that brought this cup. It was like a horn. Yeah. And we were drinking this red wine. And it if and if you don't drink this horn, they will kill you. It's a habit. I yeah, yeah. Really? They will kill me? Yeah, yeah. If you wouldn't, if you hadn't uh, drunk it, they would yeah. have killed you. It's a joke. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm still alive. Okay, Mike. I, I, I have. I'll tell you what. I, I, whoa, whoa, whoa. I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a question. Uh, I, a lot, a lot a time, a long time. I wanted to know about it. Um, about uh, this guitar player. This is one of my favorite in Grim Elmstein. And you had the opportunity to play with him, and I wanted, always wanted to know how to to cope with this guy because he's some kind of a genius. And uh, what was the time when you was in touch with him? Uh, I was I played with Ingve for two years. I did this record called The Seventh Sign, and then we subsequently recorded the uh, Budokan DVD. Budokan DVD, and I, I, I would say there was many nice experiences overshadowed by a lot of negative experiences uh I, again i'm not a drinker okay um, my father was an alcoholic and most alcoholics are the same yeah and when you're working with someone that's using drugs and alcohol it becomes very difficult especially if you're not using you understand yeah i've played so, in the band in, in the russian band and i know what i know about it yeah yeah well, and yeah, you, some of you Russian guys can really put down that vodka, man. I could never, <laughs> I could never, never drink with a Russian guy. It's very, very dangerous. But, you know, some guys can handle it and some guys can't. And uh, actually, most people can't. Sooner or later, something happens. But that was, a, there were many difficult times. The rock and roll. Uh, Full time rock and roll time. Yeah, if you want to call that rock and roll, I'll be honest with you. I think acting like an asshole is not necessarily rock and roll. <laughs> what about Ozzy? <laughs> what about I, Ozzy? I think rock and roll. Rock and roll is a spirit, you know. It's a. It's a rock and roll is about. Well, to me, when I was a kid, rock and roll was like, fuck authority. Okay, we're gonna do what we want to do, but that doesn't mean you have to be nasty to everyone around you that's that's not what it's about. outrageous yeah i mean it's a different lifestyle it's a rock and roll is a lifestyle I, I wouldn't say it's a it doesn't give you a license to treat people differently and to and for, for you to be think that you're better than everybody i don't like that i don't hey, like ha that arrogant ha have you read the biography of keith richards yeah i love that yeah, love yeah, yeah. this richards. is rock and roll yeah this is rock and keith roll richards is He's a genius. No negatives at all. Only fun. Yeah, you can see that. He's always having a good time. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. really, he's the first guy to play guitar, distorted guitar. Ba -ba -ba -da -da. He's a genius. Yeah, yeah. He, he's really pushed the music into a different uh, sphere. He yeah, changed direction. But what about Ingui? Yeah. Uh, okay, he's a great player. Uh, I would <laughs> I wouldn't say he's all bad, but he did some things that I don't necessarily agree with. I think he he overstepped the boundaries of good taste with me more than once, and finally I had enough. And and, and I'm not the only one, but um, you know he he's in the history books as a legendary player. You yeah. can't take that away from the man. He's written some good songs. Uh, he let me do a drum solo. He was generous in that way, and I think that uh, playing with Ingbe was was good for my career. It helped me, but it was a hard two years. It could have been more fun. That's what I. That's the sad part about it. You know, I mean, I, I don't really like 
when you when you play in a band, it's like I'm the boss and everyone has to do what I. Hey man, relax. If you if you hire someone, say if I have a band, and I and I say, okay, I like your guitar playing. Would you like to join my band? The guy says yes. Okay, play play guitar. I I asked you to be in the band because I like how you play. I don't try to change you. So that was a difficult. Thing. There were some difficult moments. So again, I, I don't want to speak bad, but uh, you know, I, I'm not the only one that has had these experiences with Mr. Malmsteen. So aside from his personality, it was yeah. a great uh, experience. Yeah, for sure, it was great, especially when we got to Japan. He's very famous over there. He's very well respected, and we were treated like gold. The I Japanese. We were fantastic. It's a great place to play. I love the Japanese people. I have a lot of friends over there as well. And what was that on the stage when you played with him? Uh, yeah. Was it something special? Or you well, just you made know, your work? Ingve is. Ingve, when he gets on stage, he's a persona. I mean, that's his show. It's his band. And when he gets on stage, he knows how to he knows how to perform and work the audience. Okay, he's got a lot of experience. And he's got a lot of technical ability, and all these guitar players show up to see that, and that's what he gives them. So I have to give credit where credit's due. He's a great player. I've, I've watched him many times in the rehearsal room, and I've stood in front of all those marshals. It really sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's and what got about a good what sound. about? He's a, he's a classic. You know, you can't take that away from the man. And what about Rage guys? Yeah, they're very different. Very different guys. Yeah. Yeah. I was in that band for eight years. Yeah. And uh, there were some personality conflicts here and there. With guitar player, Victor. Yeah, yeah. Victor. Yeah, he was, see, Victor he was seems to me like a very professional guy. Very funny. No, no. Okay. I've touched some string, <laughs> some emotional strings. <laughs> so I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I don't care about this guy, to be honest with you. I mean, I've played with guitar players that are way more famous than this guy. I, I think maybe he takes himself a little bit too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> even Steve Lukather doesn't take himself so seriously. Wow. And even Ingve. Ingve is actually more cool and relaxed. So. Um, Well, I didn't know about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but uh, is Victor Russian or is he Belarusian? I think he's from Belarus. Yeah. Yeah. Not so he's not really Russian. Right? No, no, no. Okay. But it, yeah. I, but it, it seems like the same people. Russian yeah. and Belarusian are very the same. I have to say though, I've been to Belarus and I I liked it. Minsk. Yeah. People were cool. It's a nice city. Okay. Um, let Okay. Let, let's talk about another project. Uh, sure. This is Beauty of the Beat. Beauty of yeah. the Beat. I don't know about it, but can you tell a little bit about it? Yeah, well, I was playing with Tadia, the ex lead singer of, of Nightwish, for about eight years. And <clears throat> after about, I don't know, five and a half years, I, I did a classical record called Symphonica, where I played classical pieces with drumming, put drumming to modern drumming to classical music. And, um, Then uh, at one time, at one point, I was talking to Taria and her her manager, and I said, "Hey, why don't we do something? Why don't we uh, do a show where I play the drums with the orchestra, and Taria can sing uh, this operas or whatever kind of show, whatever kind of songs that she enjoys?" And they liked the idea, and so that became Beauty and the Beat. I actually named the project. Ah, It this is my, uh, this is the project with her. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah. I named it. Ah, and it was okay. my idea in the beginning, and then uh, we did a tour. We did a lot of shows in Russia. Can I Russia. enjoyed the hell out of it. I had a great time. It was probably one of the most fun things I've ever done on stage because I got a chance to sing. I also got a chance to joke around. I had a lot of fun. Really, it was a beautiful memory. But it ended. Why? Well, uh, there was some, a little bit of confusion at the end of my time with Charia. It seems that some of the band got a little bit jealous. Rage? Because, <laughs> yeah, because I started to become a personality. It's like, no, you're the drummer. You stay in the back. 
It's like, no, I'm I'm not in the back. I'm in the front, man. It's so a, it's a tough business. There, there were some problems inside the band. Uh, where some people had a problem with me, and uh, yeah, I had to go, and then no more Beauty and the Beat. It's a shame, really. Yeah, okay, but it's not so bad. You got a lot of Life things to on. do. Life goes on. She goes on. I go on. I, I don't have any hard feelings, but you know, <clears throat> as I got older in life, I started to realize something: that for everything you do in life, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Enjoy the ride, but most <laughs> times the end is not so nice. <laughs> life, life is not the result; it's the process. Yeah, it's the way. That's right. That's the right. way Our of life is a roller coaster ride. Nothing is beautiful all the time. So the way of a warrior. Yeah, Samurai I, I mean, for me, the phone always rings. Somebody always calls me to play drums, you know. But if my services are no longer required, so be it. I move on. No hate, no uh, no problems. I'm happy. I'm, I'm always happy to make music. I think maybe I was too happy to make music in that situation. I was accused of showing off. And I was like, even in rage, they accused me. You're a show off. You're no I like, I'm entertaining the people. Yeah. Would the guys in Rush tell Neil Peart, no more drum solo? <laughs> no. It's a tough so, business, tough business. Yeah, it's a strange business because you have a lot of strange mentalities. You know, you're working with people from different countries, from different political, uh, <coughs> social systems, and then you have ego, sensitivity, maybe some alcohol thrown in, <coughs> a little gasoline on the fire, and then you, you know, poof. You know, uh, they, <coughs> they say that rock and roll has no boundaries, but in the real life, you have a lot of boundaries, a lot of limitations. Ooh. And they're all in the human heads. Oh, yeah. It's very strange okay. and weird. Well, let me tell you something. When you get into a tour bus with a group of 12 people for a month or two months, you get to know everybody within five days. Yeah. Very fast, okay? And you have to be cool because you're living together with strangers in a very close situation. And when you're working for someone as a sideman, which is what I normally do, I am there to serve the wishes of the boss. Okay, whoever is banded is, if it's Ingve, Ingve's the boss, I, I do what he asks me, okay? There's rules. You're not just gonna, a lot of young drummers think, yeah, I'm gonna get in the band and I'm gonna do this. And, yeah, yeah, not yeah. Really. No, no, yeah, you're yeah, not. Yeah. <laughs> There's rules to be followed, and I've actually lost some gigs because I was too, too energetic, maybe too much show, and they're like, no, you're too much. I'm the star. <laughs> I want people to look at me. You stay. We turn the lights off on that guy. Wow. Not easy to be a drummer. <laughs> and not only the drummer. Yeah, bass player also gets a lot of heat. <laughs> Keyboard player. In the Any bar. talented man has issues with bosses. It's true. There's a lot of rules. Actually, heavy metal has a lot of rules. Like you have to have certain haircuts, certain clothes. You have to, you know. But yeah, I don't yeah. Know why? Why is that? Okay, like okay, that. okay. Another another topic. Uh, how did yeah, Kiko Loreiro get connected with you? Oh, Kiko. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, I was living. Uh, I was still playing in Rage at the time. I was living in Hamburg, Germany, and I got a call from Kiko, and I just knew that he was the guitar player for Angra. He came to Germany. He didn't and, play in Megadeth uh, at that time. Sorry? He didn't play in Megadeth at that time, yeah? No, no, no. This is well after Megadeth. Before. Megadeth is recent for him. So, yeah, Anger was his main band. And I didn't know Kiko, but he came to Germany. And we rehearsed in my practice room. I had a practice room in the head in the basement of the Headbangers Ballroom. Wow. After. So we rehearsed down there for about four days. The music was very complicated very well written uh, Kiko is a great guy I consider him to be a good friend he's a, he's a Brazilian guy he's uh, relaxed he's happy excellent excellent guitar player excellent piano player composer uh, very methodical the way we worked together and uh, we went into the studio we recorded that first record in Germany it was a lot of fun and I think the, the fans enjoyed that I, I did two records with Kiko I like it I like the music did he say to you why he has chosen you for his drumming? 
To be honest with you, I'm not. I never asked him that, but <laughs> I think uh, because when I went to Brazil the first time with Roland Grapple, uh, I did a record with Roland, the guitar player, Roland Grapple from Halloween, ex yeah. Halloween. <clears throat> we did a tour there for his uh, solo CD called Kaleidoscope, and um, we toured in Brazil, and the people seemed to enjoy my playing. So. My name started to go up there, and then I came back with Rage. More people saw me, and I'm, I'm, I think I'm quite known in Brazil. So maybe my name was high on the list, you know, of drummers in the world or something in Brazil, and Kiko thought, oh, maybe this is the guy to play my music. There's a lot of double bass in the music, it's technical. There's also, the interesting thing about Kiko's music is, is that it has a lot of Brazilian rhythms. The Maraca two influences, which is not easy for a white guy like me <laughs> to play. I'm a gringo, you know what I mean? I'm white, so I learned a lot. It was challenging, and uh, I respect Kiko as a man, as a player, and uh, he's a good friend and he's a funny guy. We have a lot of fun together. He's really cool. And uh, do you know he's uh, a colleague, uh, Dirk, who's in Megadeth Dirk? now? Dirk. Dirk uh, Van Buren, yeah, yeah. drummer. Yeah, he's a good guy. I met him. I went backstage. Uh, we did a festival. I was with Avalanche, and we, I met Kiko, and I went back, and I met uh, Dirk. Dirk was eating a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> he's he from. Time to shake my hand. He was eating the burrito, but he gets some energy. But yeah, he's a great drummer. He's cool. He's from Sweden, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Or, Scandinavian I guy. Thought, I thought maybe he was from France at one point, but I don't think so. Not with a name like Van Buren. Okay, he's from Sweden. I think that he's from Sweden, yeah. Okay, I he got played with Soil Work. Soil Work, uh, his first band. Yeah. Actually, I watched the whole show. I watched the whole Metallica show, a uh, Megadeth show. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Freud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. Freud don't mistake. Mr. Mustaine. Oh, dude, did you say Metallica? <laughs> I watched the whole Megadeth show, and it was really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was really professional and really tight. I enjoyed it. That's the first time I ever saw them play, so it was cool. Good okay, man. okay. In in uh, in our wrapping up, let's do a little blitz. Okay. Okay. Um, I asked briefly, but you don't have to answer briefly. Uh, who's the best drummer in the world? Technically speaking. Yeah. Any Buddy. any kind of uh, reason. Buddy Rich, best drummer that ever walked the face of the planet for sure, hands down. A Buddy friend, Rich. a friend of Frank Sinatra. Okay, <laughs> I know that you like Frank. Uh, I do, I love him. Can a metal drummer play quarter notes on a hi-hat instead of eighth notes? Sure. When Why galloping, not? when galloping. What? When galloping, uh, playing thrash metal um, rhythm. Do you understand what, yeah. what I mean? Yeah, sure. You can play But notes. But Dave Lombardo says that it's cheating. <laughs> Cheesy. Cheating, cheating, I mean cheating. Cheating? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he plays a lot of blast beats, so I would have to take his word for it. But I mean, a lot of people told me when I was a young guy, if you have two bass drums, you're cheating. Not really. Yeah. Okay. So uh, have you? It all depends on your style. Have you seen any bears in the streets of Russia? No, but I saw some wild dogs, and they were coming after us too. And you survived. That's great. Yeah, it was in Stalingrad, which which is now called. Uh, wow, it's, it, it's a shame for me. Uh, second show we played with Rage at the guys Volgograd, the Volgograd, Volga, Volgograd. Yeah, Novograd. It used to be Stalingrad, and yeah, the guy, the guy said, "Hurry, get in the van!" And I'm like, "Why?" He goes, "The dogs are coming." <laughs> and they were, they were biting the tires of our van. I was looking out the window. Like, These uh, Russian dogs <laughs> are they furious. Like, oh, they, they were hungry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all Russians, yeah. What's your biggest dream related to drumming? My biggest dream? Related to drumming. Oh, God. I would like to play... Uh, I would like to play drums for ACDC. Wow. Yeah. Or I would like to do one song dressed as the Catman and play for Kiss. Just one song. Well, we have to. Eric talk... Singer is a friend of mine. I should ask him if I could dress like the cat. Let him. Let me come up there. Well, one song. 
And what about Phil Rudd? We have to talk about it with him too. Yeah, but ask Phil Rudd. I love Phil Rudd. He's a great drummer. All the drummers for ACDC are cool. Chris Slade is cool too. Yeah, I agree. Okay. And great band. Tell a few words about your Pisces cymbals. Well, I've played a lot of cymbals. I've played Zildjian, I've played Sabian, I've played Meinl for many years. Uh, they're all good. They're all good and all the people at the companies were very kind. I appreciate everything that they did for me. But I have to say that the Peisty symbols are special. It's a Swiss product and there's something about the manufacturing process and maybe the attention to detail, you know, the Swiss mentality. They make all the watches in Switzerland. There's there's something, Jeez. something yeah, there's something special inside those symbols and they record very well. And um, Uh, there's a lot of hand hands-on craftsmanship and I've been to the factory a few times in Switzerland and I noticed that they kind of their approach to making symbols is kind of the way people here in Italy make wine yeah they age the symbols they do I mean also Zildjian does this too after they treat the symbols so uh, like I said all the companies are great everybody's making a, a great product they're all usable but I, I feel good with feisty right now I was with Meinl for many years and I started to see the the company was going through a change and they also, Meinl, uh, with all due respect to them, uh, they have a lot of great up and coming drummers yeah, that's using great. their product. So uh, maybe it was time for me to move on. That's why I, I decided to change. And the reason John Bonham played them, that's I think uh, the only reason. John Bonham, Stuart Copeland, Cozy Powell, 2002. Ian Pace. Who is a magical symbol? Ian Pace. Ian Pace. Yeah. There's there's a lot of. It's weird when you go into the Peisty factory, you see all these records on the wall, and they're big, big, major hits. Guys that played Peisty, Jeff McCarl. Peisty symbols are on a lot of big, big, famous records. Mike Tirana. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at the I'm at the bottom. Nico Nico McBrain. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. All those yeah. Uh, English guys I like Paisley. I love uh, the British drummers. I, I grew up on the British drummers. I think they have a really good, uh, more of a laid-back feel. When I was a kid, I used to I was into this band called the Babies, and the drummer was a guy by the name of Tony Brock. Do you know who he is? Yeah, Tony yeah, Brock? yeah, yeah. He played with Rod Stewart for a while. Ex excellent drummer, beautiful groove. I used to play to those records and go. This guy is awesome. Also, I like Kenny Arnoff. Kenny Arnoff has a great groove. But he plays Zildjian. Played Zildjian. Zildjian, yes. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Zildjian and Tama. Simon Phillips. I like Simon Phillips. I love his sound. I love his tuning. I love his uh, his technique. His uh, his touch. It's amazing. Billy Cobham. I like Billy Cobham. I can go Sabin on. I love, guy. I love... Yeah. Billy Cobham plays Sabin, and Simon plays yeah, well, Zildjian. Yeah, and I, I said Billy Cobham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Will Cahoon is great also. Tony Williams. Well, what are your what are your plans for the rest of the day? Well, today uh, the sun is out. Maybe I go for a bike ride. Later on, I'll play some drums and maybe drink a beer or a well, glass of wine. That's great. Well, I have to ex express my gratitude towards you. Thank you so much. I'm honored to have you here today. And I think that everybody on our channel will be astonished with this episode. And uh, I, it will take some time to translate it from English into Russian. Because we are over one hour now. More oh, than yeah. one hour, Long yeah. Interview. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's great. I will cut <laughs> everything that is related to... Uh, Ingui. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. no. I well, won't. You know, I, I really don't like to say anything negative. I really, I, I did in the past. Yeah. But it's not a good thing to do. Uh, it's better to just put out positive energy, and you know things happen in the business. You have to uh, adjust to it. That's the it. older we get, life. the wiser we become. Again, please. The older we get, the wiser we become. It's true. It's really true. I wish that I could go back in time 
like what I know now, if I put it into my 21 year old body, oh, I'd be a good guy. I'd be really good. <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes, you know. But we learn from our mistakes. It's true. You know, I think Einstein summed it up perfectly. He said the definition of madness is repeating the same behavior, expecting a different result. Yeah. And we agree with Einstein. Yeah. Actually, the most important things I've learned are from the most painful things that I've experienced. Sometimes when I've, I've left a band or I've been fired from a band, it really, really hurts. It hurts, it hurts not only financially, but it, it hurts in the soul. Yeah. Nobody likes to be fired, you know, and so, but it happens, it happens to everybody. And you have to understand that, okay, what did you do wrong? Was it your, was it all, all your fault or their fault too? You always want to say, oh, them, it's their fault, not me. No, no, no. All, yeah, mo all motivational that. books say that it's an opportunity for you. It's not bad. It's just the opportunity, possibility to make, to, to become better. And that's it. I guess kind of a Buddhist way of looking at things when, when one door closes, many doors, many other doors open. Go through the door. Don't be afraid. Go through the door. Well, this is a great conclusion, Mike. Thank, thanks. Thank you. My this, pleasure. Thank my pleasure as well. I say some Russian. Спасибо, друг. <laughs> yeah. Спасибо, друзья. It's a plural. Uh, plural. Спасибо, друзья. 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 Oh, друзья. Спасибо, друзья. That's great. To all of our subscribers. Спасибо, друзья. I got it.